Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Canines Talking Sense. This is episode number 102, called Tracking Predators with Wesley Vischer. We've had Wesley on this podcast before, but this time I wanted to bring him back and go over more focused conversation in regards to tracking, in regards to the conservation work that he does with dogs. So in this episode, we'll get into a lot of that information, and I hope you guys find it useful. Before we begin, I just wanted to go over a few things that people have been asking about recently in our feeds, and that is we have our June Detection Dog Trainer course coming up. You can go to www.fordk9.com to get that information. That's the one with myself, Michael Ellis, and Natalie Morris. It's a two-week class. Spots are already filling up, so don't miss out on that. And then on May 20th, I am doing a traffic stop seminar up here in Santa Rosa, California. This is open to all law enforcement or trainers who actually train dogs for law enforcement with a letter of support from the agency. So those are two little updates we wanted to get out there. I hope you guys enjoy the episode, and I'll talk to you soon. My good friend, Wesley Visser from Holland and his company, Scent Imprint for Dogs. Wesley, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, Cameron. So uh, it's good to be back. <laughs> yes, it's uh, like me and you were saying before we started, it's been a while since we've connected, but then let alone be on the show. I think it's been at least a couple years since uh, we had an episode with you. Yes, I think so, yeah. Was a yeah. long time ago, and then uh, we texting for a month. Hey, when you're at home, <laughs> when yep. I'm home, when we have good uh, internet connection for a new talk. But uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> yes, and it's you know right as well, I'm about ready to take off on another trip, and you know so we we got this in the last minute. But you know a lot of our guests may have heard of you, some of them may not. And like I said, your company sent imprint for dogs does a number of different things. Just give us a little, you know history again about a little bit of your background and how you got your your company going and what you do with that company now yeah no, it's good i hold it uh, of course a little bit short <laughs> but uh yeah no i my name is wesley fisher i'm uh, working uh, more than 70 years operational with working dogs uh, start as an explosive and aquatic uh, dog uh, handler and uh, before i did some uh, sport tracking for for example um, a search and rescue with my uh, private dog um, and then uh, there was no stopping. So uh, the first five years, I only focused as, uh, as a normal dog handler, uh, work everywhere, like with passenger screening people, um, normal screening dogs. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we did we did a lot, and then um, uh, yeah, at that level, I was invited by uh, still a good friend and a, a little trekking mentor. Not little, but a, a good uh, mentor like Jeff Shetler. And he say, uh, Wes, can you come uh, to my place um, yeah, to train and work there three months? And it's a really good tactical tracking uh, um, yeah, training style. So it was an amazing experience. And it was never my goal to start my company. But then I was thinking, hmm, let's uh, put uh, a video online that I train uh, one of my puppies, a Cocker Spaniel. And uh, yeah, then... A lot of people see that and respond on it. Wes, can you teach about that, about detection or about tracking? And before it was never allowed as a professional uh, dog handler to give like lectures or seminars. And then I was thinking, no, yeah, if I uh, can do it, I love it. So let's give it a try. And now it's almost uh, 10 years uh, celebration of the company. So uh, yeah, from that side, uh, yeah, we do a lot. <laughs> so yeah, we you... focus on... Yeah, so you we focus. Quite a yeah, keep going. Yeah, sorry. Now, yeah. So what we do, what we do now, we focus on. We have a training facility, a small training facility that we train dogs uh, for clients. So I don't have like uh, a lot of dogs ready to go. So I only have now. Uh, if people ask me and they give me a, a good time frame, I can train a dog uh, in the basics, um, uh, in every in every in every environment and everything. And uh, the other side, we're teaching uh, in detection and tracking, and we have our own operational uh, dog units from uh, conservation dogs to leak detection dogs, uh, and of course, the normal, uh, um, yeah, uh, narcotics, uh, explosives, and uh, other discipline disciplines. 
Yeah, it's it's you know I've watched you. You and I have been friends for oh well, gosh, it's got to be close to fifteen, sixteen years, I believe, something like that. When we first, like I said in the other podcast, we met each other through the magazine article that I wrote about markers. Yes. And me and you were instantly on the same page about that. Um, and then we've both seen each other kind of grow and do what we do. And I've always admired, you know, like just the, I'll just take the conservation part for a second because that in itself is such a unique field. And I've seen you be extremely passionate about teaching the dogs detection and protection of other animals through conservation detection. And, uh, you've got to go to some really amazing places around the world to bring these dogs who can help catch poachers, to help locate things being shipped illegally. Tell us a little bit about probably one of the most popular conservation detection dogs that you guys train and what it's trained to do and where you guys do most of the work with these types of dogs at. Yeah, so conservation thing is uh, is, is really difficult. Um, um, yeah. A lot of people ask me, Wes, how I can be involved in conservation and how I can get a job into it. I say already at front, conservation is a passion for, mm -hmm. for me. So I don't do that for the money. I have like the other uh, type of work that I do for the money. Of course, sometimes when there is a big NGO asking uh, for a specific project and when there's money available, uh, they pay me, of course, and uh, sell, uh, buy the dogs uh, from us. But in a lot of uh, cases, I uh, train, for example, a tracking dog as puppy uh, till adult. Um, and then I donate them uh, to a project, uh, to an, uh, a park or um, an, an, a non-profit organization that don't have the, the budget to do wildlife conservation. So um, they do everything with what they can in the power. And that, that park needs a really good tracking dog then I um, give them to them. Of course, the animal welfare and the training, um, yeah, they need to have options that I can do that, but uh, the animal welfare is number one. So I work a lot of times together with uh, Global Conservation uh, Force. It's a non-profit organization uh, uh, from America. And I say, listen, I want to help. So I can help with training and I can help with uh, with the donating sometimes uh, uh tracking dogs or uh, wildlife detection dogs. So um, yeah, that is for me my passion and it's an unbelievable if a dog uh, that I train from pup and I you got a message from uh, from the, the trainer over there. Listen, uh, Thor did a track from 17 kilometers um, from the national park to the poachers front door. That 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 is like crazy because that's not happened a lot of time. And I did a lot of urban tracking with that dog. And um, they're really surprised that he tracked to the door. And they, when they opened the door, they found all the evidence and the, the poacher was there. He was really surprised. And that's for me, uh, yeah, if I heard that, or when the dog's finding likes primates, baby primates had been smuggled in boxes in Indonesia, yeah, then it's for me uh, so amazing to hear. That's why me and my team are training this do those dogs day in, day out, there's no better payment for that. That's like my proud. And now with my little boys, for example, my two sons, they see videos that we train and race together and that uh, they are working with the elephants and uh, they working around elephants. It's like a story to tell. And that's for, for me really important before I was children, but, but I have now children it's become even more interesting because I see every video what I make, they're watching on TikTok all the time the videos and they know what the pangolin is. They know what the rhino rhino horn is. They see on the pictures the rhino horns with horns and uh, the rhinos where I make the pictures from, they have no horn. So I need to explain to my son, this is why. Because of the buffa, it's like the poaching in Dutch, okay. um, that is going to catch them. And that's, that's for me uh, an unbelievable drive that never stops. <laughs> yeah, that's... Something that's, you know, for to train in the position that you are in, to train dogs to help protect other species of animals is such an amazing thing to be able to do. And it's, you know, in the detection dog world, to me, those kinds of dogs and that specialty doesn't get nearly enough attention because 
it, there's a significant impact that these dogs can have by doing this job in protecting some of these other rare species that who knows how much longer we have left with them if we didn't have this resource. And of course, we also know, you know, we wish these resources were much more available so we could make a bigger impact. But the fact that they exist and you're doing what you're doing is helping that, you know, save that one more animal or save the, or catch that one poacher who then we're not, you know, allowing that individual to continue to pillage and take all these amazing species of animals that we have. The, I want to get it, so there's kind of two tracks that you do in the conservation. One is the detection of, like you said, either certain types of animal, um, I would say like parts, I guess. Like, so like yes, shell, body parts. Yep, body yeah. parts. And then there's the tracking aspect where you guys are going after the hunters or the poachers in this case. Um, so let's go with, we'll do the detection part first. What is the most common uh, detection, conservation detection dog that you guys do? Is there a certain species that is the most poached that you guys are trying to help detect to reduce the trade of these things? Or is it pretty equal? I was just curious to see what is probably the biggest thing that you guys focus on when it comes to detection with the conservation aspect. So if you look, there's a site, a special list. It doesn't matter where in the world, even here in the Netherlands, there's a list between like rhino horn is number one, um, pangolin scales. That's also the, the biggest animal uh, trait in the world. And it's like even really easy to catch because if, if you, if the pangolins fear, they feel like attack, they roll up and you mm -hmm. can take them. It's like easy. Um, and what they do is, um, pang uh, rhino horn, pangolin, ivory. And, uh, for example, your uh, lion bones, uh, that's also been smuggled a lot. And what you say before, for example, first they go for the tiger in Asia. The tiger is not anymore there. Now they go to the jaguar, South America. And I always say to people, it's not an animal. You take the whole biodiversity out. If you take one predator out, the whole ecosystem have a problem. So the rhino horns, the rhinos have a really important uh, role and same as the elephant, the forest elephant that they're making the roads in the jungle, they're making even water is going in. And every every time they, they drop their scat, a seat is coming out. So that is the, they built the rainforest and mm -hmm. people, they living over there, they poach them, they go for the fast success, but they mess up that, that thing. And the other thing is, it doesn't matter traffickers will traffic narcotics on the same road they will traffic wildlife on the same road they will traffic uh, people so uh, they just do everything to collect money and they prove already with uh, with the wildlife poaching they funding uh, terrorist um, attacks so that has already happened before and that's why a lot of people and a lot of countries they look for the other sides because they think oh it's just wildlife protection and I say it because America is one of the most uh, active country in the world that funds wildlife projects worldwide. So I do a lot of projects that the, the government from America spend money on because they know what the, what the traffickers doing uh, and why they use their money. So even I say to people, it's not only about the animals. I love the animals, but it's, it's also uh, what they do with the money. And that is a really dangerous thing. And uh, everyone is focused on nar narcotics. Every country have budget to, to fight against narcotics. But if I ask what do you do about wildlife, a lot of countries say we don't do nothing. And especially in, Af in Africa and Asia, the government over there, they don't see it important. Mm. It's, it's, it's sad that, you know, these, obviously these countries are very poverty stricken and their ways to make money is almost this is why it's so sad that they have to go to these extremes to to go after these other animals to, in order to make money and to do things but then the fact that it's really turned into nothing but a much larger criminal enterprise 
And like you said, it's not just the poaching. The poaching goes into human trafficking. The human trafficking goes into terrorism and so on and so forth. So there's all these layers. And to think that a dog trained in detection of these various species is going to help have a much bigger ripple effect into these other major criminal enterprises. And at the same time, I know just from, you know, the background of things that you and I have shared and talked about, the dangers that come for being a handler of these types of dogs. So I'll walk through the process and you kind of tell me where I go wrong and, and fill in some gaps. But first step is a country or a NGO, non-government organization, reaches out to you and they say, hey, Wesley, we'd like, you know, two, three dogs, whatever, trained in these different things. Like you said, ivory, uh, peregrine, and all this. And, and for people who don't know what the other one is, it looks like an armadillo, kind of, for those of us in the United States. It looks like an armadillo. It's a specialized um, – I guess I'll let you kind of describe what the – give them a description of what the uh, – I don't even know I say it correctly, but the peregrine is. I think I will send you a picture so you can put it in uh, maybe in, uh, in the, the, the video here. so people can okay. see it. Yeah, so it's like uh, it's like even bef- before I don't know what the pangolin was. Yeah, is so um, it's uh, but yeah that type of animal would you say that's they look a little bit the same not completely of course but it's in the same group. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's yeah that animals is, is uh, have a really huge problem because for every scale that they use we found like uh, containers full if we yeah. found something it's like containers full so how much animals do you need to fill up that container it's like ridiculous yeah and, and like you said it's so it's these scales that they get from this animal and then it, it's kind of like a shell is the best way i can describe for the listeners and viewers and we'll for the video ver- version we'll put a, a image of it up the yeah it's Again, it's a very unique species, but it's then you like you said then it, then it's the rhino horn and then the other yes. ivory trays, the tusks. I mean, and those who have seen whether it be Nat Geo or Discovery, where they 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 go they share some of these anti poaching things. It is very sad to see when you see a tusk of an uh, elephant that's like, you know, two meters in length. You know. You know, six feet for those on the other side of the, the uh, spectrum there with our with our metrics, but it, it, to, the size of that animal just to kill it for those tusks is unbelievable, and the dangers, like I was saying a minute ago, for those who do that. So as I was walking through the process, the the organization contacts you, says Wesley, we want you to train these dogs. And then, so you train them up, starting off in Holland, you have the materials that you need to train them with. Um, now, in some cases, have they had to send you materials to train the dogs on? You know, because I can imagine these things aren't always easy to get a hold of, at least legally. No, the the specific list what I give, um, most targets I have here uh, in yeah. the Netherlands, uh, with special permission, uh, CITES paper, of course. But some animals, I don't have it here. But mm-hmm. of course, uh, the get sent tubes, for example. So, for example, I have no rhino horn. I just been back from Africa, and I got there uh, a trainer uh, that already put some uh, get sent tubes together with uh, with the ivory, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, then I take those tubes and and uh, fly home. So that's what I do, and that's also what I advise uh, a lot of times uh, to other units because even in the same countries, it's a problem if we go out of states. Uh, with a real ivory or with a rhino, rhino, or, or it's dangerous thing. So think about if you're uh, one of the handlers and you need to travel from one place to another place, and the people know that you have rhino horn, they will go for you 100%. So it's also a safety thing. Um, and yeah, um, a lot of samples we have. And uh, the first thing what I ask is what is what is the operational um, deployment we're going, where you want to focus on, because I have deployed uh, with the wildlife detection dogs on the most crazy and hectic place where I can never be imagined. So, of course, I say it to you before that even as an explosive dog handler in Las Vegas, it's a crazy <laughs> thing what, what those dogs need to do. But I have searched uh, around hectic like so many people with uh, all the farm animals and 
that I was standing there and after 10 minutes, my head was full that I think, what is this crazy place? Uh, so yeah, the, the thing with the, the, you need really powerful dogs, uh, really good stamina, but also the, 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 yeah, the, the environment so strong and some things I can never train. It's unbelievable what the dogs can do and with the uh, humanity um, and the temperature. So even if we talk about the tracking dog that track in the heat, it's unbelievable what the dogs can do. I'm still surprised every time I go out from a trip and I'm like, whoa, this, uh, I'm still surprised every time. It, it's truly amazing. Again, so you say, okay, they, they contacted you. We're going we're to train the dogs in this. Now, like you said, the environmental aspect alone is huge to prepare a dog for. And like you said, these dogs are going to work in Indonesia, Africa, and some really unique places with extreme different wind, or I say wind, weather conditions, such as, like you said, high humidity, high temperatures, um, very wet and kind of like marshy type, in, like so it's like going through swamps, things like that. Now, at least in the Netherlands, you guys are a very <laughs> wet country, lots of water, lots of things like that to work through. But what would you say the average training time it takes you for a conservation dog? So they've contacted you, now you're training it. How long do you need to train it before you then get ready to go to your um, target, the, whatever the, the location is that you guys are going to go deploy in? So the normal wildlife detection dog that work on uh, border cross, uh, airport, seaport, those dogs you can train a little bit faster. Uh, I say like uh, yeah, four, uh, five to six months if they're green, really mm. good green dogs, uh, really high search uh, and environment strong, of course. And the thing is, um, because years ago, um, when I starting with uh, hunting dogs, like the Cocker Spaniel or the Springer Spaniel, everyone was saying, what are you doing with those dogs? And I said, listen, to my colleagues from the airport, I said, listen, if I give a Malawa with this drive, what we need over here, and I give it to a handler that never worked with dogs before, it's dangerous. Even mm -hmm. if an, an, an shepherd will spin in the kennel, the people in the beginning are afraid to take those dogs out of the kennel. So again, then I starting with uh, a really small Cocker Spaniel, for example, or Spring Spaniel, and you see those dogs are like amazing, small, easy to transport. They need a little bit of food uh, in compare, because that's another thing. I've we've, we've, Sometimes we work so remotely to get dog food in a country that don't have sell dog food. Uh, so we need to ship them over, take the dog food in. It's like logistic, a really thing. So that's also something to keep in mind. Uh, but especially the tracking dogs that work like, uh, and I'm really um, did a lot of research in tracking trailing, uh, and especially the different training styles. Um, yeah, with a tracking dog, I I train. I like to train them from puppy age, and I think when they sometimes I'm lucky when the dog is like mental strong, uh, one and a half is good to go. But sometimes it costs me two and a half year. And I look for the dogs, they are bred to track for genetic sites. So think about Bavarian and Hanoverian. Uh, they are like born to track. So uh, with my system, after two weeks, I can train a ranger and then they can do the job. Even my son can walk behind them. They are so easy to read. Uh, I don't say that other dogs can, uh, can, of course, they can do the job, but then they need a lot of times more uh, hands-on training. And that's sometimes when there's no budget, uh, that's yeah, that's a problem. So I like to to go for the natural thing why the dogs are are a bred. So that's why I like also the other podcast what you did about the genetics, eh, the breed and everything, because that's that's how I look also in the specific disciplines, especially in conservation. If I need a tracker, I need a tracker. Sometimes, if I have a specific scent dog like a Bavarian. I, and I want to track an, uh, an animal that's on the move, for example. And uh, I, I know if I do him off leash, he's gone in the jungle. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then I know, oh, uh, a, a field Labrador or like a Cocker Spaniel or a Springer Spaniel is easier because they're coming back. So I really look also into that. Uh, but the trackers, yeah, they cost me more time to, to make them ready because those tracks, what they can do over there, that's unbelievable how long distance. And they track for hours on a real case. It's – you just mentioned some – you know, you, there, your description there was – most people don't even have to think about that. But you had to think about, okay, 
the type of people who are gonna be the handlers of these dogs, they don't deal with dogs very often. So I have to find something of a breed that's easier to work with. So then that eliminates some of the dogs that you would you could use in other disciplines. But now, so you need to pick a specific type of breed, easy to handle, easy to transport. Yeah. Then, like you mentioned, the other logistical thing, getting food to these regions so that way they can take care of the dog. Then teach this handler who has probably never touched a dog in their life before to work with that. And then it have a, have the dog who is not only tolerable of the environment they're going to have to work in, but then tolerable of people who are probably nervous to reach out, touch, handle, at least at first until I'm sure you put them through the school, which we'll get to in a second. But so this dog has to be very resilient, very happy go lucky. Like you said, good stamina, good focus. So the whole selection is the main key here. Then you go to the training aspect. And would you say, what, three or four months of training just for detection? Uh, and, or give us a timeline of a detection dog versus a tracking dog. How much time do you think you need in each category usually? So, for example, like an, an, if I buy a green dog that have everything like the perfect green dog and I look like uh, if I, sometimes there's also a shepherd, but if I take them, uh, the Kong out, they drop the Kong. There, a lot of uh, governments say, I don't want that dog. But that dog is like really easy and good. It's really yeah. good hunting drive. Uh, I say, yes, bring him. And I got really good search patterns, independent and easy to handle. So those dogs. So a normal wildlife detection dog cost me like what I say, uh, five, yeah, five months uh, to six months. Uh, yeah. But then it's not like a basic. Uh, so I'm not training only. In my environment, I travel everywhere on ships. I go to schools. I go everywhere. Um, roadblocks, uh, train uh, the roadblocks in. So we, we, we stand uh, somewhere uh, in the middle of nowhere, and then two, two cars are stopping. And every time we make something like scenarios like that. So I need the dog to switch in a second. Um, and of course, uh, the best thing if, uh, is that uh, we work also a little bit on fitness. So the stamina gets better. Uh, especially if we do special search deployment because we did also like that we come with our Dutch dogs to a country and then we don't need to work there two two weeks and then we go then we are off so there's special uh, special missions um, and those dogs are really uh, training with them together do running together running 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 searching running and they got become on a level like really high when you go even after two days they they can go. It's like unbelievable, uh, fascinating, and normal. I say the best thing if I send the dog to a country, he stay there. And we do a, a three weeks hands-on course, and then I say after one month I come back because then the dog is used to the to the climate and eat, and then we can keep going. But if I take sometimes my own operational dogs and we fly to a, a tropical climate, after two days it's unbelievable. They they are like boom, they are working, um, and that's. Those dogs are difficult to find because those dogs, most of them come from specific lines and I raise them as puppy because I know exactly what, uh, how good they are and that they can, uh, can get also not damaged by the, uh, by the, by the, the travel because, uh, that has been also hectic and a normal tracking dog. If you, um, yeah, a normal tracking dog, I don't like to, 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 to buy like green dogs and start tracking, for example. So I like to, to raise them. And then it sometimes it costs me like a year or, or two, uh, two and a half year, depends on the mental state. I also find out how bigger the breed is, how more time it, it, it costs to when they're ready. So I, I again, uh, a Cocker Spaniel, I've been training some Cocker or some Springer Spaniels. After seven months old, they are like ready to go. It's unbelievable. They are machines. And uh, how bigger the breed is, how more they need time to grow up in the mind. And it's fascinating when we do the puppy program to see that. Um, so yeah, and of course, and especially if people ask me, okay, West, the dog need to also do urban tracking. It's like urban tracking. Then I want like systematic dog that work on the, on the ground track you can switch also in the proximity. Um, uh, when they go coming close to the contact, then I really say, if I need an urban tracking, I only do it from puppy age because I, then I can program really good or from nine months old. And I want that I never done any man trailing training before or like searching for people because yeah then i need to train maybe something out uh a dog um but yeah and then there's some other things that's even more difficult so think about uh i've trained a dog that i travel to the ivory coast 
and they researchers come by and say, Wesley, we need a dog. Uh, that's almost impossible to find this endangered animal. It was like a pygmy hippo. Uh, there's like a small hippo. It's dangerous. Mm-hmm. It's the ghost of the jungle. And they say uh, they were collecting scat from the animal and sent them to the Netherlands and look if they're female or male. And that was even to collect scat over there. Fresh scat was difficult. So it cost already like a lot of time to find the scat. So they asked me, what do you do? So I say, uh, because I trained before, like dogs standing at front of the boat and they're searching for fresh activity with other projects. So I say, I will go there. And a little bit in the, uh, uh, they say, can you do that? I say, a little bit arrogant, 100% I can train that. And then I was going into the research book and I was looking, oh, there's not a lot of uh, people that found them and cost them months to find any fresh scat or track. And I was like, uh, okay, Wes, now you need to do really something. So with that dog, we trained like, I think, uh, six months before, really intense. Cost me a lot of time to send one trainer out for the whole day with that dog because we do we need to do normal area search, on leash and off leash. Uh, over there, they're also predators, so I can off leash. That was not the thing what I want to risk, so I hold them on leash. I did some really good fitness, and I need to do water search. Water, water search that the dog standing at front, and as a compass, he give me the direction uh, if they found fresh activity. So that project was really uh, fascinating for me as an as as a handler because that uh, was a climate and of course I did some jungle trekking but to search for a really large animal and shoot the humanity from 90% how long the scent was was staying there was unbelievable and from far I say whoa I see a proximity and a researcher was every time was there to put uh, notes out and that dog surprised me so much because I take him out to the cold Netherlands. Uh, go there and after the travel I say okay on Saturday we built a platform at front and say hey let's go out for a little training because that that boat was higher so Mm -hmm. my boat is lower so I say I need to do some training to see how the circulation goes on the water and everything and and we go out for the the idea was a training for one hour and then I see a huge proactivity from so far and we already see on a little bit scat, the dog was in the lens already given an indication. But if you see the territorial from that animal, how far the dog was showing emotion on odor, it was mind blowing so far. So it was on the river. I say, whoa, whoa. And uh, that's why I say to a lot of times with people that train on too small amounts and not realistic odor, don't do bullshit things. Because if you do that, uh, you, ne- you will miss the large, uh, large amount. But that dog was surprised. He stand, He found in one hour f- fresh cat, fresh uh, um, tracks. And we cannot put it on social media because we want to hold it special to everyone. But uh, I, And I place to research. I say, I want here. I get here an indication. I want a camera trap here. And a normal tracker guy, so researchers say, no, we don't do that. We do the normal here. I said, that's why I'm here. We look. I look as a, d- a detection dog handler. I see a lot of activity here. Let's put a camera trap out here. Here is the freshest point. And guess what? Where we see them live on video, where, where we pass by, on that place where I say where we we put the camera trap. And then they see also different behavior, what they n- normal never s- see. So in that short trip, uh, we get so much data and information. Uh, uh, and normal, they send a whole research group. So that costs a lot of money. And of course, they need to send the dog a transport and cost a lot of uh effort to end that the dog can enter a national park that course it's already like for months the 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 organization was busy with it but it's mind-blowing because the dog was searching one hour or one half hour on the front of the boat and he never stops and then i go on contact on land and i track on land like one maybe 35 minutes and i was thinking oh a break and then he keeps going and then i think oh we go back to the boat i, I stop because i never search so long and then the moment when he stands on the water, he can search for hours to make a switch between boat and uh, jungle. And it was rewarding for the dog every time we switch. But if a dog standing at front of the uh, front of the boat, he don't s- spend a lot of energy. He's just standing like this. But that Springer was like mind blowing. He searched the whole day. He, I cannot stop him. I tried to hold him like this, but he was like when he smell, he was going out of my hand. He was like. Let me stand here. It was unbelievable. I never 
see that 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 long search is in, in humanity what they don't know and that temperature that is unreal the and like you said earlier i want you to tell us or take us through the process of so like you said you know you're gonna get a tracking dog and you mentioned yes. you want to start with a puppy because of you're able to kind of customize the things that you need and build the right habits in there so take us through the steps and the age range so how young is a puppy for you when you start doing some of the tracking and what are you doing in that early stage and then what do you do let's say at six months old and then what do you do obviously you're going to get mission ready at the end but tell us like how that process starts with a puppy and gets to that point just before you go operational okay with puppy so the first thing is genetics of course i look for the best lines then i go to a litter i do a puppy test and i put already like uh, i, I want to see how they search so I, I take some sausage, uh, spread it on the floor, a whole puppy come in, they will start eating. I take one puppy, I set them on the other side of the room, and then a puppy that starts searching immediately and ignore all the brothers and sisters, that means something. And I even try them out to pull them away from source, and they go back to source. And I, and I look how strong a puppy is then. And even when I take a puppy completely to the other side, if the puppy is still searching, those dogs never let me fail on uh, searching. So that puppy can maybe later have medical issues, uh, environmental issues, but on search drive, they always top class. Uh, and that's a really good puppy test. And then I take that puppy and I set up like a track. Uh, before I start training about that, there's a, there's a, in the worldwide, there's a problem because people think in boxes. And what do I mean about that? Um, for example, you have the man trailing technique. Man trailing is that uh, they hold the dog, they chase up the dog and run away. That kind of exercise is the same what you do with search and rescue. So you have a dog off leash, you run away and let him search. That dog will use the air set most of the time uh, to find the person. If you track in the middle of nowhere and your sh distance is like 800 meters, 600 meters, the dog, there's no human activity, will find it. So I, I did that system. I like especially the air scenting and, and the proximity. That's the moment when how longer the, the track become, how more the dog will use their nose. But I live in a country and a lot of Europe and even America, they set up exercises and the dogs become too strong in air scenting. And then the problem starting that the dogs are avoiding the ground track and they're going to walk like Stevie Wonder, I always say as a joke. So the nose is up and air scenting because they don't want to spend that energy on the ground. And uh, of course, there are some dogs and breeds that are born to track. So a beagle will go down, a German Shepherd will go down, a Malawa will hunt and look for, for with the eyes. That's what they, what they do. So then I have nothing against man training. I really like the man training about the proximity alert because a lot of people they do too much tracking and they do also I say a little bit bullshit tracking. So step by step. The dog's not allowed to, to open the mouth or do the nose in the, in, the, in the sky. And even when they do the nose up, they take a fresh nose and they go tracking again. So I use article to confirm the track, to make the track important, and especially the urban tracking. I cannot make the urban inter, inter, uh, interesting for the dogs. So a lot of dogs, they come from the soft ground. They see the streets. They start running to the other side of the grass or they're starting to run it, uh, on the side. And they got to check for people. Now, what I want is that a dog, I give them a toolkit to learn, okay, I, if I follow the track, I, 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 get, I get articles with human scent. And then it's all about the match sample. And I reward, and then they keep track. Um, and then when they come in close to the person, they switch to the air center. For, for your information, I do 80% of tracking. And uh, the rest, 20%, I do man training. And I do that when I have new people uh, that the dog have never trained before, and then I send them out. And what you see then is that the dogs are staying better on track. And um, I train also like difference that I do like only people, people, people. But then again, yeah, the dogs are so strong with air scenting. So that costs me time. That's why I want, to, especially if there's some urban in the face, then that's why I say I want to train or a dog that is like six months old, or I want to start as puppy so I can program them so good on tracking that, uh, and that's what I like because every time I take two puppies and then I train the man training system, the tracking system, and I starting to 
yeah, to make a combination from both from both worlds. And a lot of trainers they look no, they only teach me this. I say look what the dog needs. If the dog is a really good air sending, we learn them the track. If their dog is really good in tracking but have no proximity alert, it can be dangerous. So I say you need to look at the dog in front of you and mixing styles and not only staying yeah, with tunnel vision. <laughs> so when you get a dog, and I, I very much agree that you have to cater the – instead of saying you're a tracking dog, you're a trailing dog, like a lot of people want to get into the, the different debates about one or the other – it, and I totally agree with you in the sense that it's a combination. Now, the level of combination depends on the environment you're working in, the type of dog you have, how to balance that out to be successful. At the end of the day, the success is graded by the fines, regardless of yes. what style you use. So we can, we can be particular. We can say all kinds of things, but the results speak for themselves. Now – Going to let's, let's take a dog who let's just say it's one that you can see naturally. It's a pup, but naturally air sense. What are you going to do to create some value to the ground? Are you just doing like treats on the ground? Are you creating bigger disturbance? Are you putting more articles? What are some of the things that you do to help a dog get a little more focused towards the ground and balance it back out compared to its natural desire to air scent? So. First of all, it doesn't matter if it's a puppy or an adult. I go worldwide to, to, to training styles. And the first thing what I do as an instructor, I look, okay, how much does the dog do ground track and air scent? And then as an instructor, I write down, oh, on soft ground, you're using the track regular, really good what I want. So I don't have to focus on the soft ground. So I, as an instructor, look what is the most difficult on the ground for that dog and which technique I'm going to use to make them better on that on the ground. And a lot of times the on the ground that are, don't leave a lot of odor, but also in Africa, for example, everything, if you come from the bush, you come to the roads, the, ro the roads are dry. And for the dog, if they see the road, they think I stop searching. Can I air send the, the next to it? So what I make do then, I make those roads interesting. So I will use articles. And a lot of people, they um, um, say in the beginning, yeah, my dogs don't like articles. And I say, no, you never learn them that an article can be positive with food or positive. I, I don't use the toy then because if the dog has the toy, it's too long. So in the beginning, what I want is that the dog, I use open cups, uh, special cups uh, with human scent. And then I place food inside. And a lot of, a lot of times I say people, Oh, they were used for this, uh, for, uh, they should will search for the food. I say, no, you will see what I want first is track, pick up the food and they will can track. And sometimes there's even more food inside and they leave the food because they want to go for the track. So I say, that is really good to see. So then a lot of people, they use, for example, too much articles that the dog every time they stop eating. And yeah, th then I say, no, you need to do better distance. But then, I, I see, okay, the dog is doing that behavior on this underground. They found for the article, pick up the food, and they will go. If I see that they do that, I will make in a separately exercise, I use article and I do indication training on the article. And then again, the indication training can be perfect when you're training at, at your training facility. But when the dog have do a track for uh, more than uh, uh, a kilometer, you don't see that perfect indication because the dog's go, <sighs> and then of course when you delay, then he gives the the perfect indication. But it's the same as detection. Think about how long does the dog need to search, how much problem solving was the dog need to do, and what's the level of the dog and shape it. So I say, for example, if the dog is because of the wind, he's off the track, and uh, he's he's he, he recover and he goes for the track and he leaves the article. I don't care. It's not about the article. Uh, um, it's it's just to confirm on track. So then you see as an instructor, you need to think about, oh, where I place the article, uh, what's the wind direction, because it's a huge impact, how large is the article, because in the beginning, the articles are larger, and then we go to smaller washers, especially on the urban, that the dog cannot see it. So everything you need to do step by step. But yeah, I first learn them to make an association between food and article, and separately, I train the article indication. So you go really fast from the food, to just human scent and they give like an indication and I say I don't care if the dog is standing freezing 
or a perfect indication it's all about the level of the dog and how farther the dog become you will see then the indication goes better but in a real in a real uh, in a real operational setting especially for example for the police where you track really long distance and the dog find the articles the same as detection you don't get that uh, Facebook or Instagram indication you just get a dog <gasps> you're standing there and you say evidence that's yeah what you need to look for of course and that's true I mean I, I went through that as a cop when tracking with dogs uh, and the track is going for a while and then you do come across an article um, like you said, fatigue and the dog's intensity level, depending on the moment, uh, will always have a effect on the indication. And it can look really good under certain circumstances, really easy in training. And when our training isn't very difficult or very long, those indications look good, which, of course, is what we, we share frequently in social media. But when you're doing a search that you've been out there for already an hour or so, and then you finally find an article, the, the good thing is because of that foundational work that you did, now when the dog is stressed, it's still going to show you the articles there, but it's not going to be picture perfect, which is why it's really important to then read your dog really well. Yes. Um, with the So we had the dog who is a good air center, but you had to help tracking. How do you do it? opposite let's say you have a dog who's just a very nose to ground dog naturally but we need this dog to lift its head up and do more air scenting what are some of the things you do there now for example um now you see also on the internet there are some people that are doing really good uh, tracking foundation uh only for example with small piece of kongs or small piece of coins mm -hmm. i like that but it need to have a realistic id so if you train that for many years and you're a police officer or you need to search for uh, missing persons. Um, if you're searching for criminals, you can build, or with the IPO program that the dog is really good in tracking, you can spend that dog and program that dog with the nose on the ground and <laughs> high intensity sniffing all the time because you're searching for a really small amount, too small amount what's not realistic, but you always try to do the Champions League thing. Um, if you do that, the dog will start to act like that, same as detection, what I've seen now, is that they're starting to, <laughs> and they search really good the tracking behavior, but as an instructor or a handler, I say, is the dog on track or off track? And they say, I don't know. I say, why you do? Because you spend too much time on too small amounts, and they're searching for articles, not for people. So I've been to places where the tracking foundation is amazing, but too amazing. And I say, listen, you're searching for criminals. So li listen, I set up an exercise and a dog is just going, find the person, but have no proximity. So proximity is the moment when a dog is from the track. He gets the first contact with the person. He switched to air scent. That is for a cop, for anti-poaching units, the most important role to read that behavior so you can send your tactical team because, again, even if you have a patrol dog, uh, if they go for the bite only, they make them too crazy in their mind. And a lot of officers are getting shot because of that. They cannot read the proximity alert. Mm -hmm. So they do too much good tracking, too good tracking, but forget to make the live operational heights with no articles, with only people. Uh, they forgot really what they're looking for. And then I say, listen, we're going to do a one thing, and that's man trailing. And they look at me, but man trailing, no. I say, man trailing is a good because you're searching all the time only for articles. The dogs even don't even know that they need to search for people. Mm -hmm. And that's really dangerous. And the most dangerous thing, what I've seen then, is that the dog behave only with the nose on the ground because they're programmed like that way. Uh, but one, it's difficult to read. The second thing is that proximity alert, they train it out so it, it's it's uh really dangerous because you just run into the bullets that's what's happening mm -hmm. we, we used to say in the in the uh, seal teams don't let that dog lead you to your death because you're just following it and not paying attention to what's going yeah. on the so so what would you do though so how do you take this dog whose nose is to the ground all the time how do you start to get them to go oh and you lift my head up a little bit and air scent is it are you doing a no. walk off are you doing it with like what's the thing that you'll do to help that dog kind of raise its nose and become less so intense to the ground which like you said depending on your operation that could be that could be useful but 
it also could be very detrimental. So how do you balance that back out? What do you use? So I just did, uh, we did just did focus on the, in Africa, like all the tactical tracking. So they have patrol dogs. So they say, listen, also in Africa, for example, if they bite a poacher, the poacher can, uh, the, the ranger become a more problem than a poacher because you bite somebody. That's like really a problem over there. Mm-hmm. So now I say, listen, you don't need a, a, a patrol dog over there. You just need a good tactical tracking team that work together and read the proximity alert and then switching over. So what we do is the same what we do of already for years, uh, Cameron, that's shaping. So I use the shaping behavior, even with the clicker, for example. So if the dog goes up and in the begin, I say, oh, the nose up, the nose up. And I see the person, um, I say, person, please stand up. I click and then the dog get a reward. And the craziest thing is that, for example, everyone train a tracking dogs to run in a person. But you can learn them to to give an, a far away proximity and they go indication and especially the shepherds, they will look with the ears as a radar. If you give them time and you see, especially where they're sitting, if you learn stop, so you climb in the leash, you hold them and then you stop and you see the dog is going at front. And then it's helpful if you do that with an, uh, an instructor that knows this, of course, then you see, okay, uh, you call out, you give them, please, please surround yourself. If they stand up, the moment you, you see that the dog is good, you click for that moment. And uh, of course, people say, yeah, but you can also get a far away proximity. Yes, then a far away proximity. I say you give pressure. And if the dog is doing this and I see as an instructor, it's open terrain or it's like close terrain. I say if it's close, uh, tight bush, we go a little bit more. So I say to the dog, go. And I give him direction, go. They go a little bit and then we need to do slow. And as a handler, you need to read really good the terrain because it can be dangerous because you can, if you go too far, so I say better take your time, read the behavior and just shape it. And that goes really fast. So I did it also, of course, uh, in a short exercise. It's not then you don't train a long track, but you just do short mm-hmm. the person call out and then shape it. That works amazing. Yeah. yeah, and it, it can save lives. <laughs> it's well, it, it matches what I went through as a police officer. One of the best things I learned from one of the veteran guys years and years and years ago was we'd be tracking along, and he's watching the dog. And like you said, it's a mixed environment. Sometimes it might be rural. Sometimes we're going to be in an urban environment. But he'd be watching his dog work, and his dog's tracking. It's like you said, a, a street dog or a dog. A lot of dogs will balance themselves out. They'll be they'll use the ground as they need to, but then they also use the air as they need to. And then the more the dog gets experience from real world, the dogs a lot of times will teach themselves, which works best depending on the environment. But in this case, what I learned was as the dog's working, every so often he would say, down the dog. Let's say I put the dog in a down position. Yes. Dogs in the down position, then he would say, this is what I want you to do. I want you to look listen and feel he said i want you to look at your dog what is the dog doing and just like you said the ears are up they're what they're yes. facing you so i'm um, watching the dog and what it's doing then sometimes you see their nose kind of lifting up like okay mm-hmm. i don't want to go that way he says okay now listen i want you to listen to your environment because you've been focused working your dog you may not be hearing things now you've been tracking pretty intently and you stop the person you might be going after has been hearing you moving through the woods and going. And all of a sudden when you stop, now they don't know what's happening. They don't know where you're at for a second. So that listen part was to then listen, are they moving around? Because sometimes when they don't hear anything, they move, they, where, where, or where'd they go? Yes. And when they do yeah. that, now the dog really can pick up on it. That's another thing. And then he said the last thing was feel. And he wanted me to focus on feeling the wind. Which way is the wind blowing? Is it blowing at us? Is it cross? Because these are all going to be things that might affect how the dog goes into the location. Because the person could be, you know, let's just say 25 or, I'll take it longer, like 50 meters out. And the wind is blowing right at us. So it's easier for the dog to kind of pick it up. Or we're 50 meters out and the wind is off to the side, but the dog's on a good ground, you know, it's following good ground scent, so we know we're on the right path. But what it might do is go straight, then all of a sudden go really far left and then cut hard back right into the wind in order to make contact. So 
feeling your wind, that last part right there, gives you a little bit more an idea what might be the approach of the dog because the dog is going to, in almost every case, approach from the downwind side of something. Even if it's only a few meters away or a few feet away, it's going to come in and go, oh, there it is. And the other side of that coin is sometimes if the wind isn't necessarily as good as you'd hoped or some terrain feature isn't there, you're going to be sometimes yourself only a few feet away from the person and not yeah. Yeah. know it yet. <laughs> this is why you have to have good situational awareness as a tracker so that way you can look around and see your environment. And I know that's probably the next part. When she, so once you take your dogs and you've got them pretty good on these environments, you now go to where these dogs are going to work. Now you have to work on the handlers. Yeah, I, what are some of the most important things that you're teaching these handlers to pay attention to when they're working these tracking dogs? Now, a lot of times those handlers are field rangers for a long time. So they are trackers with the eyes and they can read the rain and know everything. So that makes it a little bit easier for me because, yeah, they, they will see exactly the moment. They start also in a brain when I say their dog is on track and they see also on track, the dog's on track. They, they see that, they keep it in mind. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, the transfer from um, tracker dog and give them to the ranger, that's easy thing. Because they yeah. they are like rangers for a long time, they can read terrain, they can they know everything about animal behavior, not dogs, but animal behavior. So that is like, especially if you have a, a good trackers, that's like really fascinating to work together because the, uh, yeah, they they read really well. The wildlife detection side, that's completely something else. Um, but and if the team, the most difficult thing is like the proximity alert, what we say. So the moment when the dogs go up with their nose and I say, okay, watch out what, if it's now open terrain, look out, it can be an ambush or from different opposite, we're going from, uh, from open terrain to close. Uh, you see, I say, watch out now. And that costs really the most time uh, for the handlers to, 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 to see that uh, the body change and read the terrain. But uh, the normal tracking, uh, basic thing, that's easy for them. But especially what you say, learning about the terrain, learning about uh, different height levels, uh, ground levels, uh, uh, contamination from other animals. It's like, yeah, a lot of things to keep in mind to hold the team safe. Um, but last time in Africa, we spent like uh, a couple of days in doing that, uh, yeah, two weeks. And then the last exercise, what we did, we go so quiet in, uh, the guys say, even when they got a special terminal uh, um, uh, to look, it was yeah. not the best. Yeah, ter the terminal cameras, so not the, the, the Googles, but the terminal. Mm -hmm. And they say, we, we only see you wearing one, one when you were like the, doing the call out. And I say, yeah, we good. Because we, we see the proximity and every time the handler stop one time and you look into the dock, I say, go, go, go. And then we are already really close. I say, that's like, yeah, the most important training if you do, uh, yeah, you're tracking for criminals. That's like the tactical training. And a lot of people don't spend enough time uh, in doing that, for example. Mm -hmm. There's the thought I'm thinking of when working these dogs and the environment that you mentioned and we're looking for poachers, there's another danger there, which is – you're in an environment with a dog that has to work through this area that is filled with other predators. And yes. isn't it natural for some of these dogs? Like, how do you guys read when these dogs are telling you there's a lion over there or there's some other animal and you guys don't see it yet? How, what is something that you're looking for and how do you guys deal with that factor just by itself? Uh, for example, at night, it was unbelievable. The last time I was uh, with Daryl's really good uh, uh, instructor and, uh, and ranger, and he got like a night drone. And I said, hey, are you going to look for poachers? You say, no, I cannot. Yeah, the poachers are difficult, but I'm going to look for big wildlife. So we see an hippo, uh, elephants. So everything what they protect, they can, they can go after them as well. So what you say, it's not only the poachers, it's also the wildlife. Mm -hmm. So uh, the interesting thing, what I see with dogs, are there are two types of dogs, especially if you look for predators. Their, their dogs are saying, whoa, lions are there. They give a an, 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 an really good proximity that there's something there uh, what's, what's looking at us. 
Or some animal, even I see some dogs in the first time when they go for a predator, they avoid and they stop. It's the same with snakes. And I say to the handlers, if you see that, that the dog stop or warn you, go out. Don't say search or track. They give a warning system. So, and you got another dog sometimes that say, I don't care if you're a lion, they go protect you. And for those dogs, I say, that's a good thing, but they feel too big. But last time in Africa, the same. We are like trekking, and we are lucky that the car was between us. But then one of the rangers see like, they say there are two lions, like maybe like a really short distance, too short distance. And we say, holy fuck, they're sitting there all the time. So even when we try to to show, uh, to fly around with a drone to see if there's any wildlife, all the time there was like a lion focus on us. And then we're like, whoa. We are lucky that the car was between because most time they know the cars from the safaris, for example. But yeah, it can be another thing if you just run really fast on a high track. That's why I say with tracking teams, take out of the speed. And a lot of, a lot of people that look at me, take out of the speed. What do you mean? We need to catch the poacher. I say, listen, I did also a study on that, especially if you learn the dog in doping, dopamine, high, high intensity track, the dogs are going, they are too hot on the track. They burn themselves out too fast. So I like to, to train those tracking dogs in lower drive because if the dog have to drive inside, I don't have to, to chase them up all the time because I know that there's the Ferrari inside of them. So I learn them to take out the speed because then I can read also the behavior better when they go in the proximity, when they avoid starting to avoid an, a special signal for a specific animal. Because if you're going too fast, you just can run in and a hippo. It, it's game over, for example. Yeah, that's it's such a you know complex set of features in the environment that you guys have to deal with to you know be successful. You know, you're you're avoiding getting killed by poachers. You're avoiding getting killed by predators. You are also trying to get the dog to focus on stuff. And then deal with all these crazy, distracting th things in the environment. There was something you said earlier, too, that I thought was really cool, which was not only are these dogs tracking, but then sometimes you have to get on a boat. And then while they're on their boat, they're air scenting as well. Yes, and I'm assuming, like some of these boats I've seen in the past, there's a platform on the front of the boat. So yes. if the dog is moving a little bit to the left or moving a little bit to the right, is the boat yeah. driver basically kind of trying to follow the dog's head movements and then take you to towards yes. the shore if that's what the dog's doing? Okay. So once you get across or on the water, off the water, into the shore, then the dog's going to get back on the ground and then go back to air scent or ground scent and, and keep working through this, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and, and it's kind of funny because in our search and rescue world um, – a lot of the dogs that work on boats are looking for deceased. It's cad uh, cadaver-related type search work. And I yes. know there is some search work, that, of course, that people do um, to maybe from a boat potentially look for where the shoreline is, where the person could have gone in. I know I've uh, some of the Border Patrol guys have, have done some of these things like this with their dogs uh, because of the rivers and the borders and things like that. So such fascinating Dude. stuff. And what, uh, I, what I would – like to have you share speaking because you brought in a couple of stories what what is something that you've give us a deployment story that you guys have done but you had a major takeaway for you personally that you said "Ooh, i need to make an adjustment in training because reality showed me something different so what's a story that you or what's something you've done and walk us through the the deployment and then what was your – something you took away and you said, okay, in training, I'm going to fix this now so that way in the future we don't run into this kind of issue again. Now, for example, the amount what you have. So it doesn't matter if you're customs, uh, border force, police. You still get a little small amount. Even like 200 pounds is a small amount, for example. Yeah. So the bulk odors, that's like where all the cocaine smugglers or the wildlife smugglers – they not smuggle something small. They smuggle something huge. So again, and that's why I say it's not about the perfect uh, indication. I want the people that they look at the dogs. They need to listen to the dogs because if you hear that, you know you're getting warm. But if you train always onto small amounts, the dogs do it this all days and you yeah. don't get the warning signal. That's the one thing. So I trained years ago. If you look for all the videos 10 years ago, I trained for the perfect indication. I trained like, well, 
that only for specific disciplines, I say, and a lot of people that take the system from the mind detection world, for example, mm. those system, what they have, it's unbelievable good, but for mind detection, not for searching detection inside. Uh, if you, I see when the people searching cars, inch by inch, if you're doing explosives, your special intervention team or a bomb squad, and you only need to check one car, and every, every, you only need to say, if I search this, it needs to be clear, then you need to do that. But when you're standing at front of uh, a border cross and you need to check hundreds of car with that dog at that temperature, it's not going to work. Then you need to look, okay, I try, I go for the amount what they smuggle or the amount where you need to, uh, where you have an explosion for, from. And then I see with the bulk odors for the car, what I train or the bus, the whole car is contaminated. So mm. you get... <laughs> And the dog got an emotion so crazy, but he cannot pinpoint because the whole car is full with contraband. And I say to the handlers, when you see that a dog is in emotional and you see the body language, you do investigation. And a lot of times we never train on that amount. Uh, I can never, as if you talk about living animals, I never have thousands of singing birds that I can play under the bus for 20 hours. Because it, I, I cannot do that. I will not do that to set it up. But the handlers see so much environment. They see so much passion from the dog that they say we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna look by ourselves, and that's why I say the dog cannot show exactly it's it's there. Yes, with a small amount, with but with a bulk amount of odor, no. Also, what you say, the water search uh, people, especially with cadaver, all the time they learn the barking. And the barking is something what you don't need to do because you can, the first contact when there is a really body for a long time in a river, in a small river, you got far away barking or when they jump in the water, that's not working. That's not, it's not giving precise uh, indication. So if you train the dog on shaping and you learn them to give an indication where he, where he thinks is the closest uh, alert, then you get a better indication. And that's why I say, I, you said earlier, we can do the blah, 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 and the tra-la-la, but we need to find it in operational. Mm -hmm. And I see, okay, a lot of good dog trainers in the basic, the sand wheels and everything is good. I also use it, but don't forget, in real life, you search maybe for something which you can never train for. That amount of odor, that height, never. Uh, I, they even try sometimes to... To, uh, to, to, to make it so difficult for the dogs that the dog cannot go with the nose on it. And a lot of people, they train to make nose contact, but that in a lot of cases, that's not possible. And, well, you, you bring up a, 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 a big point right there. There's, I think, one, internet, social media, and so forth, people see something that looks really good to them. So whether it be a brick wall, a wheel, boxes, whatever, it looks really fancy for the indication or certain searching behaviors. I mean, I just, it, it, it blows me away. For example, I just, just the other day, I shared a video of my little dog, Ammo, searching our little pipe wall. That video got, and it, it's like 45 seconds, he does a pipe wall and he does the wheel. And I was just, I was just showing it for his whistle condition reinforcer. So it's just, I beep and then he comes and gets his toy from me. Uh, so the, that video is 46 seconds or something like that long. And it's just him searching the pipe wall. He locks up n real nicely. I, I use the whistle. He comes off, gets his reward, do the wheel. He does the same thing. So, But that video alone, like I said, 56-something thousand views in the past few days. I do a video. And easy to uh, make. Yeah, exactly. And then <laughs> I do a video of a search and let's say a, a more complex search. And people just want to fast forward through it because they just want to see the ending or what it looks like. Yeah. And, it, and it's funny though. So those values right there, the point I'm making is those values tend to focus on where people will spend their time. Ooh, I want to make a really good search type of uh, behavior in my dog. Or I really want that nice indication. But then they're missing out on the time that needs to be spent on – the environment the dog's going to work in and can it do those things there and a lot of times that may not be as appealing to us or um 
it, it's, it, and if you're doing it for social media, it's obviously not going to get the likes that you're looking for. So therefore, internally, is not reinforcing for the human sometimes. They're like, well, this, if you, if you looked at it from my point of view, well, if I would keep making videos of my dog searching the pipe wall, I'll get more and more views and more and more likes. But those videos I've shared of the dog going searching cars or searching um, an open field, looking at was, was for me, it was a negative. I did a video where my dog was searching a uh, big, wide open area. There was nothing there. Yeah, it does okay. Uh, but that's the value. What I liked was the search that was much harder, much more difficult to learn to read my dog. Because, like you said, though there is great value in doing those fundamental things, we get kind of hung up on them too long because of whatever motivating thing for us. Maybe it's easy so we can get some good training in. Maybe it's because, like I said, the setup was is not hard to do, where other setups are much more difficult, require more areas. So, But we need to, depending on the type of work that you do, focus and spend a significant amount of time to be successful there and keep going back to your fu- fundamentals are always going to be important. You always go to them in various stages of training. We just got to keep that balance better and, and make sure that we're getting good enough time for the experience in those environments, which we are they're required to work or the conditions of the environment that they're required to work. Kong or my odor or my whatever in a brick wall is not going to do the same thing in an environment outside with all yes. kinds of other things in play. So I, that's where I, I get afraid like you do of when we see things and we want to work it really heavily in a wheel or something, but it's actually much more beneficial to get that dog exposed to these other environmental conditions and how to work through those versus getting highly reinforced in this other environment. And there's this thing that um, uh, Bob Bailey shares. It's called behavioral mass. And if you spend a lot of time in this area, you build really strong behaviors and really strong things here. But all of a sudden, when you go over here, it doesn't translate very well. You see much more failure. And that's only because in the animal's mind, well, this over here is way better than this over here. Until you get the mass shifted over to now, it's either more even or you build up more experience and more behavioral mass in the thing that you're going to go do uh, operationally, which is where the success is truly measured. It isn't in likes. It's in our results in what we find or and in some cases the lessons we've learned and what we didn't find afterwards. So is there is there an experience that you went through um, – where you kind of you kind of described, did you go on a deployment? Like maybe it's been you first started and you were searching and either you had a failure or something and you're like, man, okay, I got to switch to make sure I'm training my dogs to a higher amount of odor. My lesson I learned was I did too low. Did you go through a search like that where you were like? Yeah, all the time with okay. different disciplines. And that's why I say, for example, a lot of people, for example, um, I have nothing against Kong. Or the, uh, there are mm-hmm. some amazing people with uh, amazing trainers. They're so good in the foundations. They make it an art. He's so good. Yeah. But I always say to people in that specific area, what you mentioned, it's good. To do it in the basic is good. But I come from an operational background. I still have an operational background. And I say, that's why I say to people, you don't have to be perfect all the time because the circumstance can be different. If you search longer, I don't get that perfect. Even with my dog, what I put online, yeah, I can make an easy video. But if I searched uh, this week in whole vessel, you don't do the same indication. So I say my thing is what I to say to the people. Listen, look at the emotional response and think about how much you do. Uh, do you do a five minute search or like a uh, whole day search? That's different. And if you can see that and you know, OK, odor can be traveling. It, it's different. So, for example, what I say. I was training also years ago, like really precise and perfection when I was a bomb dog handler. Then I switched to the narcotic side. <laughs> and then first thing, my, my target was moving. So I need to follow a target. And then uh, I got that same indication system when I need to search in the prison. In the, and I got an indication in the middle of the room, but I cannot say it's there. So, for example, I train a lot of dogs with an indication, stare or look, and especially uh, in a lot of disciplines, not explosive or forensic, that they touch by themselves. And then I click. So in the moment when they go to the sandboxes, click. That one is a game-changing in a lot of disciplines because 
And a lot of people say, show me, show me. Nay, don't do that. Only when the dog does it by himself, you shape that. And in operation, I got better uh, indication like that. And for example, when I was starting doing the leak detection work uh, under the ground or invasive plants, holy damn. So I see all emotions on a really big area that was taking that big in the beginning. And then I go and then I hear, oh, oh, I missed something. Or no, Wes, it needs to be in this section. And I say, let me guess. I go to that place where I see a huge emotional response, but not a final indication. But that that ground was so long, there was so long a leak that it was like it going farther, farther, farther. And it was in the ground. And for so much of area, I was saying, oh, I train precise, but I need to train a lot of distance. The same with the invasive plants. I search first search for one invasive roots. I can find it. And then I was searching. I was searching with an operational handler. And the first time I see like 400 meters, full width of motion. Indica- Don't give indication here. And on the exit, indication there. And in the meantime, all emotion. And I say, it's there completely mm-hmm. everywhere. And I say, no. And guess what? It was full with not with over there. <laughs> so that need to change from one odor to multiple odors, not close to each other, but maybe five meters away, five meters away. And I say the same thing with the narcotics, for example, in a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a ceiling, not one target scent, place there another target scent that the whole roof is like full with odor. And then sometimes you see that the dog is giving an emotional response, but the handler think, okay, no final indication. And I say, listen, look at the ceiling. The whole ceiling is full with odor and that's an overload and odor. Yeah, no, that's... It, that's a great lesson to learn. Like you said, is you know, in training we focus on one thing or a, a, this amount or from a, this amount to this amount, and then all of a sudden, in real world though, they have to be able to find it. Uh, it could be covered all like the whole entire. It could be five meters long of the yes, target. Yeah. And, and how to, and the dog was had again. The behavioral mass was look for one small thing over here, very easy to pinpoint. And not a whole lot of behavioral mass on something really big and really long and really wide, and then having having to deal with that. Now, I, I would love you to tell us a tell us one of your most favorite deployments you've been on that you worked a dog, whether it be Africa, Indonesia. Tell us what's what's a memory that you have of one of your best deployments and ones that you were like, this this is amazing. I'm I would, this is a special kind of uh, thing. Walk us through like tell us like from the if if we were you know, watching a movie here with you, tell us how it went down. Yeah, I got the stories like I cannot choose. That's like uh, I did some 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 things out completely out of my comfort zone with disciplines. Every time a new discipline gives me new information. So what I say, if you uh, searching for animal that's on the move, but people on the move, it's amazing. What I uh, what I like the most is like what I say, my my story that I go to the jungle to the Ivory Coast, to a jungle that I never know, I never see before. I never know uh, the, the, the terrain, uh, the humanity, the animal, the, the behavior. Uh, that was for me mind blowing because that dog put like what I say, one and a half hour on the boat, then he go on the land, he get energy. And I was thinking he's done, he go back on the, on the land. And that was mind blowing. But also what I say, when we go to Africa, or in Malaysia, what I say, we need to track like for a poacher camp. So we're not searching for one poacher, but the dog need to go give a proximity and he give an indication. And then the, the rangers go and hand and feet to watch because we are with four men and they are with 10 or 50 people. So we don't want to run to the people. And then every time the dog gives a proximity high on the mountain. And then I say, whoa, watch out. If you go down, you see nothing. You just run into it. So those stories are like, unbelievable if you if you see that and that if you find something and especially living animals that give me like uh yeah really a good feeling but i cannot say that one stake out because every deployment what we do in i see uh yeah every yeah uh, i cannot choose about that it's like yeah, unbelievable yeah. <laughs> i do too much i i make sometimes people make a joke on so- social media that they say it's a little bit uh, james bond styles with uh, then this type of search, then we go with the boats, then we go with the helicopters. Yeah, it's also feeling a little bit like that. So I'm lucky with so, uh, yeah, cool things that hold me every time, uh, yeah, thinking and not uh, thinking, oh, I know everything. No, you can never know. We don't live long enough for that. 
But it's unbelievable. The dogs surprise me every time, every in every situation. Uh, one of the things I've, I've watched you do uh, through social media there is uh, one of the searches you've done is on boats. What's it like to search with a dog on a ship? You know, because it's one, it's moving all over the place sometimes, depending on how the sea state is. And then the second thing is it's very different types of environment to search in. Small spaces, um, yes, very easy to hide stuff. What's it like to work on a boat? Tell us a little bit about that. Now, what's interesting, for example, if you need to do cruise ships, it's all about how you work. So I work with, uh, my, uh, I have like a Cocker Spaniel and a Malawa as an operational dog. And for example, my Malawa is like, he have like seven years of operational field experience. So that dog comes in a room and it's a smaller room. So the first time when he come in a room, I know after five seconds, if there's odor, yes or no. Because if I hear, I give him time, you work it out. And otherwise, you go back. On that side, before, and that's something I think what you learn in those years. In the beginning as a handler, I learned to uh, do a free round and then systematic search everywhere. But then you come on a level, I know my dog and I know, okay, only corners I present there or the limits are oh, searching outside. Here I need to make sure, especially on a vessel high uh, corners or when uh, the wind is too strong, I need to do more detailed search over there. But if it's quiet wind, I don't have to do anything because this dog is working it out by himself. So on that way, the dog holds his, um, his energy level so much and you can do like 500 rooms in one day. Uh, of course, in uh, between uh, breaks, um, but then I still have energy and a brain left for the dog to, to do all that work. And a lot of people, if they go in those vessels and they don't, don't know, they spend too much time in their uh, normal search and uh, um, yeah, detail search. But for me, is it really fascinating in those years uh, that my uh, tactics are also be different. So I look, if I come in a room and I think you are the same, we look like, oh, open place, easy, this is more closed. Oh, this is really airtight. The only place, for example, with the money detection dogs, they're searching for a lot of amount of money. Uh, I put them on my narcotics dogs, for example. And what is the most interesting thing? So those dogs that searching for years, even the smallest amount of, uh, of cocaine they found. Uh, but with currency, it's different. Even when I search for criminal money, so I need to search a lot of amount of money, I see that the dogs have more time uh, uh, after those years to, to imprint. And then I know if I see a safety locker, I need to make sure if I give a detail there that they not go in and out because I know it's not working. All those safety, if they sniff, then I know I can go with my hands. If I do the same thing with narcotics and I sh uh, uh, they look, they, they even in free round, they take it out. But then with the weaker odor and the same thing with the explosive, it's really important if you know I work with this discipline and there's one weak odor in the picture, then your techniques need to be changed a little bit. And that's like also really fascinating to see. So those vessels are small, are also really uh, warm. So then I also say to the people, if you need to search like all the rooms at one time, you can better do uh, uh, one deck, uh, only the rooms and then go outside. So the dogs get fresh nose and then going inside. So change it a little bit up. And then I see also when you change that a little bit up, of course, you need to hold everything on the plan and uh, know that. But on that way, it works also motivated for the dogs because they get stimulus from a new environment and need to search. But mm -hmm. if you do every, like the same with the football stadium, if you need to do all the seats at one time, the dogs get, oh, I'm already doing this. And all those little cobines, they look a little bit the same, especially if they're like cruise ships. All the rooms look the same for the dogs. So try to mix it up a little bit. That also give uh, a new inspiration. Uh, but the yeah. engine room, that is something that I say, then you really need to look out because a lot of times those the, 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 the sounds and things are so heavy that I say after that you give a break, uh, even for the strongest dog, because, because the sound and the, and, the, uh, and the smell is like unbelievable crazy over there. Yeah, especially the engine rooms are crazy. And, and you said something in there which I thought was great. I've been sharing it more recently as well. Um, and that is take those boring environments and make them fun. And you can do that pretty easily. Like I, I shared a video, I think it was a week or two ago, where I was like, take the environment and put something that's in, put something in there that's not there normally. 
So, like, if I'm searching the, a lot of the same kind of rooms, maybe bring a, bring a bag of, cl- of clothes in and just toss the clothes all over the room or toss trash all over the space. And all of a sudden, that room Ew. that they're just, yeah, always, whoa, it's different. And then they <laughs> process it better. Then they start re- – because these are things that will happen, the, the rooms that always look the same or those that work in a prison or work, like you said, at a hotel or a cruise ship. Those rooms are all the same. But in training, if I can every now and then throw something different at them – then when that happens to them in a real situation, they're like, oh, okay, I know what this is like. I've been here before, and they know how to work it. Plus, like you said, it takes away the boredom from the dogs. If they're constantly searching the same kind of thing, you can reduce boredom by introducing some weird things into a common or previously known environment. And I think people kind of we, – we forget to do that sometimes. We forget to uh, get the dog motivated by throwing some things in there. So I want to have you do two more questions. One is – What's the advice you would give somebody in tracking? And the second question is, same thing, what's the advice you would give somebody in detection dogs? So one piece of advice for tracking, what's really something important that, it's in, that you want to share with people? And then one also in detection. It's a little bit same. So one thing, everyone for tracking is training to find the person, reward the, gro- reward the ground track. So it's not only payment at the end, but especially after difficult corners uh, or like a road cross, the article, because of the article, the dog gets reward for it. And you start also to focus more on the, on, the, on the track and not only at the end. And detection the same. Everyone is training to find, 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 find. If I ask, how do you reward the dog? They say, find. Nobody trains to the search. So what mm. you see what's happened, that a lot of dogs... If there's no odor, they give a false indication or they become brain dead and they start walking if there's nothing there. And then I did something because I did it already when I was working at a a cargo screening, for example. It's all the time the same. It's boring. Even I hide 10 times the odor. It doesn't reward the dog. It's still like, ooh. Then I surprise the dog by one, I do in keep going signal. So when the dog is searching good, I clap in my hands, say, come. Sometimes treat, sometimes uh, toy, boom, start going back to search. And sometimes how I train also the false indication out of the dog. And a lot of people say, you're crazy. I say, listen, first of all, I hide the toy, not inside things, but I just drop them on the floor, drop them on an object. And no conk. So, for example, if you do cone indication, I don't want the indication. A lot of times a dog become tired and they think, oh, I only do the indication because I only get a reward if I indicate. No, what I want, search, grab and uh, grab the toy. If you do that, you see that the dog's getting their fire back, and that's helping also to help them to search longer blanks. So it's a little bit the same, not only focusing at the end by finding an, an, a people or finding the target, but in the meanwhile, reward the search. That is the most important thing what I can say. If you do that and you, you start, step out of your comfort zone and you start doing that, you will see that the dogs are even searching better and can search longer blanks. Yeah, and you see the fire. The fire is coming back, <laughs> and you're bringing up something that obviously is near and dear to my heart, which is the blanks and rewarding the blanks because you're technically rewarding the search, right? So the dog yes. is searching, doing stuff. I'm happy with it. Um, there's somebody I know. We're probably we have some commonality. We know them. Uh, a friend of mine, Florian Schneider. He's a mixture of like what me and you are. He's um, very much loves rewarding the search. That's very important to him. And I watched it was I was very interested in watching how they did it. Now for them, he the dog will search. He's very happy with it. Uh, one of the things that he, he may do is call the dog to middle. So the dog comes between his legs, he rewards, does whatever. Just like you said, back to searching again. Mm-hmm. And um, he will also he also will do the same thing on the indication. Sometimes the dog is indicating, he's like, Okay, come to me. And he makes the dog wait and then he can redeploy again. But he, it was a very interesting concept that a lot of people don't embrace, which is just like you said, focusing on the search and the effort and keeping that really good. Because just the most important thing you said there is it reduces the falses. Because if the yes. only way to be right is to find something and there's nothing there and the handler is not stopping the search for whatever the reason, the dog's going to pick something. There's no other answer here. How do I get done with this? Obviously – experienced dogs kind of learn how to manage this better than the newer dogs experienced handlers learn how to read this better than new handlers but if we create a good focus on 
this search work, rewarding that, rewarding great response in the sense of the dog searched this area, there's nothing here, show me nothing's here, this also gets reinforcement. And that will build a really good, strong dog versus a dog who thinks I always have to find something and there's always something there. In training, there we always have, we always end with a find, or even let's say they have a very busy operational environment and they're finding stuff frequently there. It depends on what kind of work you do, but you have to really make sure we're focusing on search. Yeah, that that leads oh. us to everything else. That's the that's the, the the machine that works to get to the end. So the yeah, yes, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, and and it's funny because we, me, you and I have. I'm, 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 I'm it sucks. I'm going to miss him. But uh, on the trip, I'm going to the UK. You and I share a good friend, uh, Stu Phillips, and yeah. Yeah, he's he's very much about the search and how important it is, and the indication is good. But yeah, S- something something about Stu. Eh? So that is the guy. If you talk about the most James Bond heights, he 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 name it. Oh yeah. He got destroyed on Facebook because he uh, he he show a video that the dog was scratching somewhere, and look at him, and then again. People destroy him on Facebook. So people that never been on deployment, they say something about him because he, 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 for them, it was a bad timing. So I start online. I was like, okay, Wes, that's why for a reason I like Instagram better than Facebook because yeah. a lot of people, even when they, people just like the dogs, they show a video, they got a, a lot of experts coming in the room. Sure. And I say, listen, look what Stu is finding. Yeah. He need to do change his techniques. He, with the podcast, what he say, he started as an explosive dog handler, then yeah. into the tobacco. He mixed with the bulk odors. He mixed things. So what he use all the time, you can open Instagram. He find another find, cash, tobacco, so much. That guy has so many finds on his name and still people destroy him on Facebook because on a small video. And I say, people look for first why he was doing this type of tactics and he changed because his finds are, are endless. And people think only about that perfect indication. That's like maybe in the sport, on the brick wall or on the car cell, there are some dog sports as well. But in the real world, if you search for when the whole roof or floor is full with odor, it's a different kind of thing. And you need to look what's working for you and then working for it. And don't, don't complain if you don't know uh, the person or yeah, why they're doing things. Yeah, the context makes a big difference so people understand what's going on. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I've seen, we, we both have seen some of the things that he's found. And it's like entire walls full of tobacco. It's well concealed, you know, and, and there, there's maybe smaller amounts of odor leaking out. Or maybe there's huge amounts of odor because some of them are like in these closets. So I can only imagine the dog coming into a small space, even though it's well concealed, it's been sitting there for weeks, months, years. Who knows? The whole room can smell like it. So the dog has to try to pinpoint. And for him, he's got to try to find that false compartment. He's got to find that that uh, spot that you're the. Where's the button at? Where is the thing at? So he's he it operationally. There's a lot of complexities there that we do have to prepare the dog for. And the sooner we get those dogs used to those variables earlier in their timeline and training the better they're going to be to be flexible to these conditions that change frequently. So there's, there, like you said, there's no better lessons than what the real world shows you. Uh, training, we hope for the best, and then, but you know, yes. Murphy's Law shows up in the real world, and we have some things we learn from that. So how do people find you? So if they want to contact you, what's your website, what's your email, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Now, just the same like uh, like what you're doing. I like to get videos from the dogs and everything. So uh, um, on Facebook, I'm there. But on my personal Wesley Fisher, I cannot accept any more friends. So I say if you only have Facebook and you go to Santa Print for Dogs, um, you you can follow. Uh, the conser- conservation site is on Instagram or Facebook, the same. Uh, you have Santa Print for Dogs and Santa Print Conservation Dogs. Santa Print Conservation Dogs do everything about the wildlife uh, things what we do. Uh, for me, of course, I share there. I try to uh, to share different types of videos uh, on Instagram. Fisher Wesley uh, put the same things on Facebook, but I cannot accept any more friends. And sometimes I, uh, yeah, uh, my son is holding the leash, so I don't want to make it uh, public. <laughs> but yeah, if they go on Instagram, yeah, they can. They, I say it's the best thing. A website, I don't have ever time to upload the website. So I say just go to the social media 
Yeah. Uh, so yeah, my personal name, Fisher Wesley, or like Santi Brent for dogs, and uh, you will find me. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll put that all in the show notes here, and I'll put it on the screen too, so everybody will see if they're watching it. And then if they're listening to this, it'll be in the show notes down the bottom. Wesley, as usual, thank you again so much for taking the time to hop on here. Like we both said, it's been difficult sometimes to connect because of your schedule, my schedule. So thank you for coming on here, sharing this information. I would love to, if you're open to it, maybe the next few months, I know you've been increasing doing webinars, and that's awesome. I would love to have you do one of your webinars on uh, our Ford K9, so that way people can uh, find it there and see it there if you're up for that. I think that would be a fun Yeah, one. I love that, of course. Yeah, I start doing that because my schedule is a little bit uh, crazy. So, uh, <laughs> I, And I, I start all with a little video, and then my em email box get explode. So I was thinking, okay, I do it. But yeah, uh, I would love to. And I want to also thank you for your time, and also especially that you're making all those podcasts and videos because uh, if I'm like off in the middle of nowhere, if I download some uh, some podcasts, that's the things what I do in the middle of uh, nowhere when there's no internet and everything. So that's why I say thank you for making the podcast. And I, yeah, that's what I do in the middle of nowhere where there's no inter internet, no Netflix. <laughs> you get I still can listen uh, to the podcast, yes, or driving <laughs> long time. So thank you, Renette, as well. Thank you very much for the support on that. I, I greatly appreciate it. And, yeah, it's been now a number of years doing it. So I'm glad people like yourself who've been doing this a long time, you're, you know, out there in the career, still enjoy listening to the different podcasts and the episodes. And I'm like you. I love learning from other people. So it's always a lot of fun to hear different diverse backgrounds and different worlds of detection. So it's really cool. And I, this one being a tracking episode is, is really nice, too. It's going to be a good uh, thing to people to take some – hopefully some information that you shared and apply it to their training. So again, yeah, uh, good to hear. Thank you for your time. And I have a nice travel to the UK. <laughs> yes, it'll be, it'll be, I got a long flight ahead of me. So again, everybody, thank you for listening. to Okay. We go.